So thanks a lot for, for coming here and joining us, um, Bishop Rudzek. But what do you think, to your understanding, what are the biggest challenges for the society? We understand there is a war, there is a problem with corruption, the Ukraine in a very difficult situation, but for your understanding, for the society in the country where the war is going on, what is the most? The fact that there is uh, a triple crisis, uh, an economic chasm, uh, a political, uh, the political challenge of reforming entirely uh, the elite, the administration, uh, the political culture, at a time of the third uh, critical factor, war, uh, is really an incredible challenge. Uh, for society, for the population, one very important thing is to try and remember well its successful methodology, the methodology of a year ago when uh, great solidarity was expressed and the people of Ukraine really began believing that they can affect change. Uh, it becomes very difficult if we don't believe, if we, if we um, uh, lose, lose spirit. Uh, and it is not surprising with all of these crises uh, if people in Ukraine are getting tired, are getting uh, uh, a bit um, anxious uh, about the future. When will this end? Uh, how can it end? Um, so I think, I think the moral question and the question of morale is very important for Ukraine today. And I know you speak to uh, both the different Ukrainian politicians and the uh, young and elder and those who've been in power for a while. Do you really feel there is a, like a strong intention to change uh, something? Because a lot of people say that it's already a year since the Maidan. And in fact, besides, of course, the war might be an excuse, but in a lot of spheres, in investigation of those who were responsible for killing at the Maidan and many, many other cases, the cases of corruption, investigation, not that many things have been done. It's true. Um, when I spoke on the Maidan in early December, um, based on based maybe my historical study, but also the experience after the Orange Revolution, I tried to share with uh, the people in Kyiv one basic uh, notion. It's going to take a long time. We're beginning a pilgrimage from not zero, but from the minuses, from profound fear, from pro profound uh, social uh, problems, corruption, lack of uh, mutual trust and confidence into a future that uh, will take, I think, a long time to uh, form. You know, in, in, in the Bible, one of the foundational stories is the story of Israel being led out of Egypt. And that, that journey takes two generations. It takes 40 years. Uh, I think Ukraine is uh, now, after 25 years, uh, it's, maybe it's halfway. Uh, I think that is the bigger picture. Uh, that doesn't mean that in each concrete case, uh, with each task, we should not be exigent and we should not be expecting uh, change. Um, I share the concerns and disappointment, I think, of millions that in, in many areas uh, the, the movement is very slow. What is in particular slow? Well, particularly the, the question of justice. Uh, we're we're uh, now m marking the first anniversary of the killings in mid-February last year, and nobody has been brought to justice for these killings that occurred in broad daylight. They were filmed. Uh, the facts the evident facts of the, of, uh, of, uh, the executions were visible immediately to the whole world. 
Um, it is a big question. Why is nobody responsible for this? But you have a chance to talk to the president. You have a chance to talk to some of the Ukrainian politicians. There is a great authority of the Greek Catholic Church and uh, you personally. What they say when you pose this question? Well, the last time I saw the president was at the inauguration. Uh, so I have not had a chance to meet with him uh, since then. Um, I, I, we do speak in, in, in church circles. Uh, uh, I speak with journalists, and this is a mutual concern. We definitely understand the fact of the Russian aggression, you know, with the Russian uh, military equipment being uh, on the Ukrainian territory. But at the same time, we understand that the fact that there are civilian casualties and the people are dead. Uh, it creates a lot of uh, outrage, a lot of dis not just disappointment, especially when we speak about the people living in the occupied, uh, when speak speaking living in the occupied territories. So, what do you think? What is the way for reconciliation? Wherever you think, what is the cause of this war? There is a huge dis not disagreement, but misunderstanding between the people who are left on the occupied territories, and what to do with that. To your, what is your idea? Well, the therapy it will take a long, long time. Modern war and the effects of modern war are now carefully studied. In, in the United States, apparently more veterans of the war in Vietnam died as a result of suicide after the war than the number that was killed during the war. Uh, the effects of trauma on uh, the human soul and psyche uh, are very strong. And what we are really seeing in Ukraine and in the problems with the political process is the effects of the trauma of the 20th century. The issues that will be facing Ukraine can in some way be predicted. They will be great. At the same time, there is uh, an incredible resolve. What happened last year uh, should not be forgotten. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, you young people came together and created this television station, uh, you created it at this time, uh, you are working, you're working in a new way now, you're developing, you're moving forward, you're global, uh, and I think that is indelible, that will not be hidden or crossed out. Uh, the experience that uh, you have gone through, others in Ukraine are going through uh, in, in their places. Uh, a quarter of the population is engaged in some kind of volunteer activity. Uh, the stepping back from this paternalism in which there's an expectation somewhere, somehow, from the top is going to solve my problem, uh, and the taking of responsibility that Ukraine has seen over the last years is, I think, a very important turn. And that's why I think it's very uh, important not to lose spirit, uh, to be vigilant, to be critical, but also to be constructive and to move forward. At the same time, uh, we still have that there are a lot of people when we go to Donetsk and the areas which are not under Ukrainian control and we uh, follow the, the news, you know, when I talk to the people there, there is a strong dissatisfaction with Kyiv and the way the war is waged, just in particular because the people had lost their beloved and that's something very, very strong. Um, so what do you think, what is the way for reconciliation of the society on the short run? today when there is a lot of anxiety and where there is a lot of rage um, and on the long run, of course. I come from Paris uh, to Kyiv uh, and tonight we are having a, with parliamentarians um, a friendly discussion about reconciliation precisely. <clears throat> what is inspiring for me, and I hope it can be inspiring for Ukraine, people in Donbass, eventually for Ukrainians and Russians, is that after centuries of war, after two horrific world wars, led by politicians, many of whom happen to be convinced Christians, Germany and France buried the hatchet. They decided 
to reconcile. In 1962, in Reims, or Reims, uh, uh, where during World War I, the ancient medieval uh, cathedral was da severely damaged uh, by, by Germans, in France, General de Gaulle and the, the Chancellor of Germany, Adenauer, met for a religious service marking the reconciliation. I was already born then. In my lifetime, the history of German and French war, hatred, became an academic subject. In other words, young people in Germany and France don't feel it. They learn about it in school. Eventually, a few years later, an important reconciliation began between Germany and Poland. Uh, again, headed by uh, religious leaders, especially the bishops of Poland, who wrote in a very bold letter, we forgive and ask forgiveness. The communist authorities of Poland said, forgiveness for what? Uh, the church is not patriotic. But these steps led to maybe even a more difficult uh, reconciliation because the French and Germans considered each, uh, each other socially um, on equal level. Historically, the Germans had looked down upon the Poles and the Slavs. The next step that was made, in your memory already, is the reconciliation of uh, Poles and Ukrainians. I witnessed, I grew up at a time and in an atmosphere where the resentment between Ukrainians and Poles was very raw. Because twice, from the Ukrainian point of view, twice in the 20th century, Poles got in the way of Ukrainian independence at the time of World War I and at the time of World War II. Uh, on the other hand, Poles uh, saw that Ukrainians had conducted murderous activity against the Poles. Ukrainians accused the Poles of the same. Today, Poland is the strongest advocate of Ukraine in the international community. These are almost impossible things. I believe that reconciliation in Donbass and eventually reconciliation uh, with, um, with Russia is possible, but it's very difficult. But what are the ways? What are the first steps of this particular political environment? The first steps are steps like I think we will take tonight uh, with parliamentarians, not before the cameras, and maybe I speak about it too soon uh, on television. But uh, to say, listen, uh, we're going to have to face this issue. In 1942, Robert Schuman, the future prime minister and foreign minister of uh, France, began speaking about the future post-war French-German relationship. In 1942, in the middle of the war, when it was still not clear how things would develop, the first step to make is to realize that, you know, Donbass will not move to Texas. Uh, Russia will not uh, split off with Antarctica and become a separate continent from Ukraine. Uh, we are, so to speak, condemned to seek uh, reconciliation. Um, it will require soul searching. It will require an examination of conscience. Here, the example of Germany, uh, I think, will be very important. Uh, I think Russians will have to face up to the question of this aggression and why they supported their leader in this aggression. Uh, I, I don't think that, I know that for a fact. Otherwise, reconciliation will be impossible. Um, and we need to look and find those people who can speak the truth, who can recognize the truth, and find ways of communicating it to others. What so far there are the obstacles for that? 
because in order to solve, you need to see what are the obstacles, in particular in the Ukrainian society as well, maybe even in the Russian, because we start doing something with ourselves, doing yes. those steps. Um, the present obstacle is the war. That is the, the, the biggest uh, block right now. Of regard, we need, we're, we're speaking about post-war, post-reconciliation. Uh, we're thinking about reconciliation after the violence. Well, the first thing is to stop the war, stop the violence. Uh, and <clears throat> we can't, we can't uh, outrace ourselves. We can't, uh, this is not going to be easy. Uh, it started in, 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 in Germany, in France, first ideas during the war. It was really 20 years later where the first concrete fruits uh, could be seen and institutionalized. In the Ukrainian and Polish example, it took the efforts of intellectuals, Polish intellectuals, for example, based in France, who were ready to speak on this subject when people in Poland were not. They spoke with Ukrainian intellectuals who were also in, the, in, the, in exile. And beginning this, in the 60s and 70s, with having much criticism, they began developing a dialogue which, after the, uh, the creation of Solidarity, became part of the discourse of the Polish civil rights movement. Of course, the uh, action and posture and prophetic role of Pope John Paul II uh, was very important. I mean, when you read a lot of media and international media, you hear this notion about the divided society in Ukraine. What is your take on it, and what is for you the united Ukraine? Well, uh, I think uh, I think the you know the divisions you no longer see on CNN and uh, BBC these maps with you know kind of the blue and orange Ukraine split in the middle. Uh, one year ago. Uh, that was uh, uh, the gospel. Um. So you're speaking about the, um, there is a lot of written these days about the division of Ukraine, the split. What is your take on that? And um, in general, there is this phrase, uh, Ukraine is united, but what does it mean in fact? What is united Ukraine for you? Ukraine is a country like many others. Uh, anybody that knows uh, Germany knows that uh, Bavarians and Northern Germans are very different. Sicilians are very different from the Piemontesi. Uh, all of this can be a great richness uh, and is a great richness unless uh, political ideology and uh, efforts like we have seen uh, in Ukraine over the last 10 years uh, begin playing a role and try to exploit these richnesses and these differences. So the issue was about the, um, there is a lot written about the division of the country and what is your take on that as also what is the united Ukraine for you and what are like practical steps to really show that it is, it's not just a logo on the TV or a sign. Ukraine is like a country like many others. Uh, Germany, Italy have, even France, uh, the United Kingdom, they have very strong regional uh, cultures, uh, even regional languages, um, uh, regional styles. It is clear that this um, antagonism that has been exploited to create a war uh, has been fostered. Uh, I visit, when I visited Donetsk uh, in past years, I was always well received by my academic colleagues. Uh, we are receiving uh, in Lviv students uh, from Eastern Ukraine and they see that the people of Lviv are not as they're depicted, uh, let's say in today's Russian propaganda. Um, I believe that uh, Ukraine in the last 10 years uh, did not do its homework in bridging the 
the, the diversity in creating a richness out of the diversity. Uh, in fact, the opposite was done. Uh, political technologists uh, posed sections of uh, the Ukrainian population against each other for election or other results. For me, it was quite, uh, quite a surprise, a pleasant surprise, that Ukrainians demonstrated in May um, a high level of electoral and civic responsibility in making a quick decision about the president. It's not the question of who was elected, but uh, the, the, the winning candidate won in every region of the country. Is it because the people were all excited about this candidate? Clearly no. Uh, the issue was the unity of the country. They wanted to manifest the unity of the country. Uh, after this war, there will be much work that needs to be done. Um, but uh, if the propaganda of Goebbels could be uh, overcome in post-war Germany, I believe uh, the propaganda of Putin, of Yanukovych, of uh, the last years can be overcome in Ukraine. Do you have any concern about uh, more or less also some urge of patriotism and the idea that, you know, that this idea that we will win and maybe the people should um, in Donbass, you know, ask for an excuse or for, you know, you have this complicated discussion in public sphere, the idea of who is guilty for what, if the people there hadn't embraced the Russian, I don't know, troops and flags. Uh, do you think, the, what is your idea? Well, that? I'm sure there will be many, many difficult questions. Um, one best way to get out of a standstill, out of a conflict, out of a negative position, is to move forward positively. What Ukraine will need is um, serious, realistic, creative projects for its future. Once people, well, I think they have to be uh, cultural projects, they have to be economic projects, uh, uh, educational projects. Uh, it will need inspiring leadership. This will not happen without a charisma and without a vision. Uh, we see in, in the past, uh, this is possible in, in different societies. I mentioned Adenauer in Germany. The incredible, incredible pits in which post-Germany was found, bombed, destroyed. Uh, so many of its men killed, its women raped. Now we're only learning about these uh, facts. And it's, of course, national identity uh, spotted and, 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 and denigrated by, by the Nazi legacy, uh, Germany showed that you can move forward. What is new about the Ukrainian identity? So is, um, what is the Ukrainian identity today? Has this changed how it's developing within this, well, the think, Maidan and the war? I, I think the Maidan is, has become uh, an important part of the Ukrainian identity. Uh, the, the Maidan now happening as, at least twice, or if you call the, count the uh, revolution on the granite, a uh, first attempt, uh, then with the Orange Revolution, it's really kind of a third gathering of people in the center of the city, in the center of the capital, replicated in many cities in Ukraine, in many cities throughout the world. Um, this, this phenomenon resonated, and the question is what resonated? It was, I think, it was the solidarity. It was, uh, it was song. I think singing is very important for the Ukrainian identity. And I think it's important not to lose that. It, if Ukrainians lose their song, the process of rebuilding, reconciliation, uh, defeating corruption will be more difficult. What do you mean by song? By song? Well, song. Melody, melody with words, singing it together, uh, singing the national anthem. Who sang the national anthem in Ukraine with conviction in knowing the words before last year? This has become a unifying symbol. 
what is the way to integrate and that would people in Donetsk would think this anthem as well? And the people in Crimea. We, we will see. I think one of our problems is uh, that uh, in a painful time, uh, we impatiently want all of our uh, questions answered. I think it's very good to place the questions. Uh, I honestly and humbly say I don't have answers to many of them. Uh, so I think we need to speak about the challenges of the future uh, reconciliation. We need to um, look at all the issues, but we also have to realize that this will be a long complicated process and the solution will be in the process itself uh, you uh, when we talk and you mentioned that you sp you've been speaking with the Ukrainian parliamentarists and raise the issues uh, while lecturing while talking discuss the um, some tale and some stories from the Ukrainian church you know on the relation with Russia on the idea of the brothers and the idea of the revenge so what is that why you raise this issue of the brotherhood and the well, this long... Uh, uh, it, it just so happens this year is the 1,000th anniversary of the death of Boris and Halib, who were the first canonized saints in Ukraine. Boris and Halib were the sons of Volodymyr, and in 1015, Volodymyr died as already an uh, older man. Well, Dimit apparently took his Christianity seriously. Um, he abandoned his harem. He uh, abolished uh, capital punishment. Quite a serious thing for a warrior who let a lot of blood and uh, a man who indulged his passions quite liberally. Uh, we don't have his diaries. Uh, but we have this very striking fact that when, after his death, a dynastic struggle occurred between brothers and Svetopolk, the accursed, as he is called in uh, the Chronicles, wanted to consolidate hold on Kiev and attacked Boris and then Hlib, those two brothers said, we will not raise our sword against uh, our brother. 900 years before Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, uh, people in the first Christian generation uh, on our, our land here uh, witnessed radically to nonviolence in a situation of political turmoil and warfare. They, they paid dearly, they paid with their lives, just like the Nebesna Sotnya, the Heavenly Hundred. We saw that the sacrifice of the Heavenly Hundred changed the country. Uh, I think that it will be important in the reconciliation process to hearken back to uh, the, the symbolism that Boris and Hlib represent for us. Uh, how to apply it? In which way can it inspire? What are the con concrete activities? Uh, I don't know, but uh, with Bishop Hlib in London, uh, Bishop Boris uh, in Paris, we are uh, announcing the creation of the Boris and Hlib Brotherhood, which will be a brotherhood of prayer. We will pray it's a Christian prayer on the chotki, which you can comfortably wear on your wrist, usually on the left wrist, the arm that is close to the heart. And you pray the Jesus prayer, a simple, humble prayer. Jesus, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, pray for me. Uh, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And you pray 33 times, and we're going to pray for men, for the health of men, for the sobriety of men. There's a big alcoholism problem for the faithfulness of men, faithfulness of men to their wives, to the mother of their children, to their offspring. Uh, pray for the nobility of men, uh, that men be happy, that men be at peace. These are soft things. These are things that uh, people don't recognize. Uh, it's not Nescafe. 
It's not, you know, boiling water, a bag of powder, and instant satisfaction. But I think there's no short way to the big questions that stand before us. What do you think about the current this Minsk agreement? I know we're coming to the real, to the today's reality. Do you believe in that? And in this discussion, that about you know arming Ukraine, having more weapon, weapon to defend. What is your idea on that? A lot of people say, like you know, you can't discuss it with Putin if he doesn't want. We see that all this discussion, more or less, are not leading to nothing else but the further fight. Over the last 15 months, I've seen that uh, what I thought might happen usually did not, and what did happen, I didn't think about it. Uh, I think nobody could predict what was happening. Uh, I will be pleasantly surprised, uh, to say it a little bit ironically, if um, President Putin um, keeps his word, whatever it clearly was today, I don't know exactly. Um, I think there needs to be much more pressure and the international community can exert much stronger economic pressure uh, than it has been exerting uh, to this point. And if economic pressure is not enough, the international community needs to realize what it is realizing only with great difficulty, that this is not a problem just for Ukraine, that this is not just a problem between Ukraine and Russia, but this is a great threat to Europe and the global community. When you, you live in Paris and you, you travel a lot, you, you, I mean, you are raised in the United States while you are a Ukrainian, so what is the biggest for you at this moment, the misunderstanding uh, by the different I mean, by the societies, by the media, by maybe some uh, political groups outside of Ukraine in the situation here? What is lacking uh, in the understanding? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think the international community uh, has been fed uh, a Russian historical line and a, uh, a Russian explanation of what is happening in Ukraine. Um, Russians think they have some kind of innate right to control Ukraine, to control Ukrainians. Uh, they negate much of Ukrainian history. Uh, not all Russians, but many do. Uh, and uh, they do not believe that this nation of 45 million has a right to self-determination. For some reason, they have been effective in communicating their position internationally. Many people say, well, you know, Kyiv was the mother of Russian cities, so we have to understand that Putin wants this. Well, if Paris all of a sudden, in Western European Latinate culture, all of a sudden said, you know, we're going to control Rome, and the Italians don't have any right for Rome, uh, I think people would say that is not only ludicrous, it is dangerous, and it must be stopped. Um, so there is a question of uh, reading the history, which translates into uh, inadequate responses to the present. In the present circumstances, uh, many believe that there is a civil war in Ukraine, that there is a war that Ukrainians started amongst themselves, despite the fact that uh, Leadership was sent in from Russia. Arms have been sent in from Russia. Uh, and the tactics are guided uh, very explicitly by Russia, as is demonstrated by photographs, uh, documents, uh, personal testimony, uh, also intercepted uh, telephone conversations. Slowly, uh, questions about this are being answered. But in the meantime, there has, there has been great suffering. And, um, you know, now we also discuss, still, it's a lot about the fighting. Um, what do you think about this idea about the army in Ukraine and the, def you know, which, which is often there, that there is no other way but to protect the country by that way? Uh, for me, war is a terrible thing. And fighting is... Uh, the worst possible way of solving conflicts. It is the last resort. 
And Russia has pushed, pushed Ukraine to the last resort. Ukraine did not pick this fight. Uh, Ukraine did not invade Russia. Um, and now, when it is becoming clear to the global community that very strong instruments need to be used uh, to stop uh, the Russian intervention in Ukraine, um, I think it is very important to use stronger general sanctions, sanctions that strike at uh, the entire Russian economy. Uh, and if not, then it will be important to consider what other instruments should be used. These days we uh we're discussing with the different people um, in Ukraine about the idea of the mob mobilization, and there is a discussion. Should it be volunteers? Should the people, you know, called by the country because it's their duty and they have no right to um, not to go to the front? Um, what is your idea on that? Can it be a, really the must, or there is a way of people to do something? I else? recommend to you, um, and those readers who can read Ukrainian, it hasn't appeared yet in English, there's an extensive, I think, eight-page document issued last week by the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church on pastoral service in a time of war. It's quite comprehensive, and it speaks also of mobilization. It says when one's country is in danger, when one's children are in danger, when family members are being attacked, when there is unprovoked violence against you, you have the right to defend yourself. In Christian moral theory, this is called just war theory. Uh, in those cases, the government has the right and the duty to mobilize citizens for the defense of the country, for their own self-defense. At the same time, the government is obligated to give those that it mobilizes what they need to serve and defend their country effectively. The church cannot be used as an instrument for mobilization, but it is the policy of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church that no priest is permitted to argue against mobilization. In other words, get in the way of a just mobilization for the just defense of the country. It's a very delicate question. Um, and that's why the church has uh, taken the time and the effort to issue a carefully worded statement on the subject. And um, in the end, so what do you think the most important responsibilities, the biggest responsibilities for the Ukrainian elite and for the Ukrainian society? Um, in political terms, it's called reform. In spiritual terms, it's called conversion. We need to change. We need to grow. Uh, we need to name things with their proper names. And um, that is uh, a, a process that needs to happen from bottom to top, from top to bottom, from the Carpathians to the Don, from the Black Sea uh, to the marshlands, uh, south of Belarus. Uh, this is a difficult process. Um, I hope that it can happen in a context of uh, growing trust. Mutual trust in Ukraine did grow in the last year. Uh, the trust is not just an abstract thing, but it's uh, engaged trust. People are holding each other by the hand. People are visiting the sick. People are donating to support uh, the soldiers. Uh, While some people are still abandoned, and many with picking about others. There's much more, there, there is a tremendous, tremendous need. Uh, and we need to do what we can to address it. And finally, um, we've been speaking with you about the religion 
here, uh, which is an um, interesting case because Ukraine has a different um, churches. And how do you think what is the role of the different churches and the religion in this, uh, in the whole situation, not just in the, in the war? Something that has been completely underreported or ignored even in uh, much of uh, global media is the central role of the churches in uh, the Maidan movement. Um, when it was dark, cold, and dangerous in the night, uh, 15 degrees below zero, uh, priests from different confessions together with, were with the people on the Maidan at midnight at 1 a.m., 2, 3, 4. There was prayer on the hour, every hour. Uh, the church, in some way, opened its door to society, and the society opened its heart uh, to the church. The churches spoke together. For many months, they repeated the same thing. The government needs to respect the people. It is a government for the people, not the people for the government. Violence is inadmissible, especially on the part of the government against its own population, but also the protesters should not resort to violence. Third, rhetoric and action to divide the country is immoral. And fourth, the dialogue is really the only way to bring reconciliation in society. This was the mantra in December, January, February. All the churches spoke together, all of them, including the Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate, against, spoke against the annexation of Crimea. All of them uh, blessed, in one form or another, the defense of the territorial integrity of the country. It was impressive to see not only the Christian uh, churches standing together, but the Jews and Muslims were standing together with the Christians. Uh, today we see that um, um, the big challenge is the position of the Moscow Patriarchate, uh, which is uh, the biggest jurisdiction in Ukraine, <coughs> and which is receiving signals uh, from its top leadership uh, to support the Putin position. Uh, there are many people on, in the Moscow Patriarchy jurisdiction on both sides. And this is a big challenge for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. But in general, one can say, I believe, that the churches have played an important role. I must say I'm a little disappointed that the government uh, does not maintain uh, a strong dialogue with the churches. Because in a time of crisis, uh, the, um, the role of the spirit is very important. And the last one, at the same time, the whole Euromaidan fight was, uh, the, 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 was also for the liberal values, for the values of the European Union, uh, if we speak about that. So do you think this society is getting more liberal? I, I, I understand that there are different issues, you know, there are a lot of different stereotypes of you. What do you mean by this world? A lot of propaganda, um, but how it goes all together when speaking about the role of the church and the, you know, the freedom and democratic freedoms here. I think, I think the society uh, has gotten more free, uh, especially it's, it, it, it is uh, freeing itself of a past fear. There's much fear, new fear in Ukraine. But um, in young people like you, I see uh, a courage and a liberty uh, from the past that um, people formed uh, in the communist system uh, might carry for the rest of their life. And I um, am not only hopeful, but optimistic in this regard.